Okay, this is the part two of the Civil Rights Movement, taking the story up to 1965. Now, unsurprisingly, given everything that Southern whites stood to lose by the Civil Rights Movement, they pushed back violently against nonviolent protesters. There were lots of deaths. For example, in September 1961, Herbert Lee was shot and killed by a Mississippi state legislator for helping SNCC organize voter registration drives. The black man who witnessed Lee's murder was murdered three years later. A black military police officer, Captain Roman Ducksworth, was shot and killed while on leave to visit his sick wife in Mississippi. He was ordered off the bus he was on and shot by a police officer for trying to, quote, integrate the bus. Paul Guillard, a white French news reporter, was shot and killed while covering the desegregation of the University of Mississippi in September 1962. A white postman from Baltimore, William Lewis Moore, began a one-man walk against segregation from Chattanooga, Tennessee to Jackson, Mississippi. He was shot dead by a white supremacist in Colbran, Alabama. All right, so it was dangerous to be a civil rights activist in this time, but uh, Martin Luther King Jr., after the successful boycott of the buses in Montgomery and a much less successful um, attempt to desegregate the town of Albany, Georgia, turned next to Birmingham, Alabama. <coughs> in April 1963, the uh, Southern Christian Leadership Conference and the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights began efforts to integrate Birmingham's public facilities and civil service jobs. <coughs> the two groups anticipated white resistance because Alabama's new governor, George Wallace, declared during his inaugural speech, segregation now, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. Wallace was kind of a perennial candidate. He served as governor several times and ran for president a bunch of times. And when Alabama finally had term limits so he couldn't run again, he made his wife run for governor and serve as governor, even though she was dying of cancer. So he was, uh, he was a real winner, as my mother would have said. Um, so George Wallace is promoting the idea of segregation, and Martin Luther King Jr. is trying to organize the African Americans of uh, Birmingham to protest against segregation. Here are the roots of the Freedom Rides. I wasn't quite sure where to put this in, in the uh, lecture series, but this shows you all of the 1961 Freedom Rides by CORE. And this is a very interesting map that shows you where many of the um, key uh, events of the civil rights movement in the South took place. Okay, so back to my story. Um, African Americans pr uh, participated in a nonviolent protest march on May 2nd, 1963. And the police chief, who was a very anti-integration guy named Eugene Connor, nicknamed Bull Connor, incarcerated 600 adults and children, including elementary school children. The following day, when the jails were full, Connor ordered that marchers, again, who were demonstrating nonviolently, be sprayed with fire hoses and attacked by police do uh, dogs, and he had his police officers beat protesters back with billy clubs. And these were men, women, and especially children, elementary school children, who were being attacked by the police and the fire department. And these uh, were nationally televised events. And it really caused public attitudes to begin to shift. During this period, um, King was among those who was arrested in the protests. While he was confined, he wrote really one of his masterpieces, the letter from Birmingham jail, in which he criticized white moderates for their inaction and for advising black people to wait for freedom. 
He explained that black people had waited more than 340 years for constitutional rights and that that was long enough. And he also said, you know what, civil disobedience, these um, selective obedience to laws is completely acceptable if the laws that you are objecting to are immoral. So in other words, laws that prevent black people from being treated as full citizens, laws that deny their moral significance are worth protesting. And he did say when people um, are civilly disobedient, they have to expect to go to jail. They have to expect to be punished by the law, but that doesn't mean that they shouldn't commit civil disobedience uh, in some cases. So letter from Birmingham jail explained that rationale for civil disobedience laid out in really beautifully logical terms. Now, President Kennedy, like the presidents who came before him, had been slow and reluctant to address civil rights issues. He preferred negotiated mediation behind closed doors over direct action demonstrations, which he thought were embarrassing, especially in front of the Soviet Union. He disapproved of the Freedom Riders. He was hesitant about sending troops to Oxford, Mississippi to stop riots that broke out when James Meredith um, integrated Ole Miss, the University of Mississippi. But 1963 marked a turning point for him, as we are going to see uh, ultimately. And when you look at the assignments for this week, you're going to be looking at some um, uh, primary sources from 1963 and also Kennedy's very famous June 11th, 1963 address on civil rights. All right, now just to switch gears for a moment before we get back to the main story, I want to tell you something about racism and inequality in the rest of the country outside the South. Because the civil rights movement, the direct action stuff was mainly taking place in the South, but that didn't mean that African Americans in the North were free from racism or segregation. Longstanding uh, social codes kept cities in the North and West segregated, for example. In Pasadena, California, African Americans were not allowed to attend citywide dances. In Cleveland, black people could not go to the Skateland roller rink. Blacks in downtown St. Louis didn't have access to the major department stores, the Greyhound bus terminal, or the Fox Theater. In the North and West, African Americans staged protests and took stands against school segregation, employment discrimination, and housing discrimination. Um, Despite the Supreme Court's ruling in a case from 1948 called Shelley versus Kramer, um, housing discrimination was still taking place. Shelley versus Kramer said owners can't have restrictive clauses, restrictive covenants that don't let them sell houses to a person or a family of a particular religious or racial group. So the Supreme Court says, you know, refusing to sell a house to a black family is not legal. You can't have that written into your, um, your covenant for your neighborhood. But um, there was still a lot of racism going on in housing. The Federal Housing Administration would not give black people mortgages, especially mortgages outside of all black neighborhoods. One of the most prevalent discriminatory real estate practices was redlining, where banks would deny loans to areas to, you know, people who wanted to buy homes in areas inhabited by minorities. And you can see here in this map of Chicago, neighborhoods have been designated by color. Um, the best neighborhoods, you don't see really any of the best ones on here, are in green. Okay neighborhoods are blue. Declining ones are in yellow and minority neighborhoods are shown in pink and banks would really not loan to homeowners or home buyers or people wanting to start stores in neighborhoods that were minority neighborhoods. Real estate agents also practiced block busting, which was when neighborhoods were becoming more African American. Uh, real estate agents would come in and say, this neighborhood is going downhill. You better sell now. And the white 
people who owned the house would sell for cheap and then the real estate agents would resell those homes to minorities at higher prices. Discriminatory real estate practices combined with the millions of dollars the government was spending on a new highway system to facilitate white flight. That is, people, white people who could afford to move out of the inner city moved to the suburbs and used the new interstate highways to commute. This meant that African Americans who couldn't afford to move out of the inner cities were very much more concentrated in inner city areas, and this was the case all throughout the country. White people also tried to create all-white settlements. For example, developer William Levitt built thousands of mass-produced homes in Pennsylvania, New York, and New Jersey in communities that became known as Levittowns. But he would not sell any houses in his community to uh, anybody who wasn't white. Also, single mothers were not, uh, not welcome to buy houses in those communities. White people used violence and intimidation to keep black people from moving into their neighborhoods. Um, they vandalized homes. They burned crosses on property. They put up offensive signs like you can see here on the bottom right hand of this slide. But it wasn't just private housing in which um, African Americans were discriminated. Black people were also discriminated against when they tried to take up residence in public housing. For example, Plans to build an interracial housing project in Cincinnati were met with resistance. In Detroit, white people were the majority of people living in public housing, but local white people said, oh, public housing is uh, run down because only black people live there. Um, black people who lived in predominantly white housing projects endured violence and hostility. So there's a lot of racial tension in these public housing process, uh, uh, projects. And there was uh, police brutality in and around the housing projects. Employment discrimination was another important issue outside the South. The NAACP and CORE targeted the employment practices of companies like Bank of America, Bell Telephone, Western Electric, um, and building and construction trades in Philadelphia, New York, San Francisco, Newark, and other cities. Black leaders also organized protests against Sheraton Hotels, Howard Johnson's Restaurants, Safeway, Sears and Roebuck, beer manufacturers, car dealerships, and commercial ad companies. Finally, on uh, June 11, 1963, uh, President Kennedy called for a new uh, civil rights bill. This happened right after Alabama Governor George Wallace blocked the entrance of two black students to the University of Alabama. Kennedy responded by federalizing the Alabama National Guard. And, you know, two days later is when he gave his speech. All right, so Kennedy gives this important speech on June 11th. Then on August 28th, 1963, more than 250,000 black and white Americans gathered on the National Mall in Washington, D.C. for the historic March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. The march represented the culmination of nonviolent passive resistance. It was peaceful, but it was really tense because uh, National Guard troops were provided and stood around everywhere policing for white supremacists you know, to make sure that they didn't disrupt the march. Planning for the event showed that in 1963, the civil rights movement had splintered among a number of different organizations with different priorities. A. Philip Randolph of the Sleeping Car Porters Union and Bayard Rustin of the Congress on Racial Equality organized the march. Randolph wanted um, the agenda to be about political advancement, Martin Luther King wanted it to be about civil disobedience. Roy Wilkins and Whitney Young, who represented the NAACP and the Urban League, um, didn't want any sit-ins or marches. They didn't want to embarrass the president. <coughs> the most militant organization there was SNCC, and the SNCC student members felt like the compromise between or 
organizations <coughs> was a sellout. They were younger and more radical, and their leadership wanted to see more immediate action. John Lewis, the chairman of SNCC, composed a speech filled with anger and outrage that condemned Kennedy's proposed civil rights bill as too little and too late. A. Philip Randolph said, hey, John Lewis, tone down the speech. And so he did. And this allowed Martin Luther King Jr. speech to be the most memorable and inspiring presentation that was delivered that day. King's was the I Have a Dream speech, which warned the nation about the danger of returning to business as usual. He said, quote, it would be fatal for the nation to overlook the urgency of the moment and to under underestimate the determination of the Negro. King also warned that, quote, the whirlwinds of revolt will continue to shake the foundations of our nation. And he linked the plight of black people in the South with that of black people in the North when he said there would be no satisfaction, quote, as long as a Negro in Mississippi cannot vote and a Negro in New York believes he has nothing for which to vote. King's speech was powerful with one line in particular standing out for African Americans, I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. The March on Washington attracted international attention. American citizens in Paris signed a petition supporting the march and sympathy marches were held all around the world, Amsterdam, Jamaica, Ghana, Burundi, Tel Aviv, Oslo, and Munich. Newspapers across Africa, Europe, and Asia both praised and alternately condemned America in response to the march. But only a few days after the march, everything got really grim again when a bomb exploded in Birmingham's 16th Street Baptist Church. The church had been the organizing center for most of the city's civil rights demonstrations and the bombing killed four young black girls ranging in age from 11 to 14. African Americans took their frustration and anger over the bombing to the streets, and during these disturbances, two black male teenagers were shot and killed by the police. Racial tensions were exacerbated by FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover's decision to block the prosecution of the three white men who bombed the church. The bombing was the 21st bombing in Birmingham in eight years, and no one had been brought to justice for any of them. The extreme low point, of course, uh, in 1963 for the country occurred with the assassination of John F. Kennedy on November 22, 1963, in Dallas. So what had been a, a tense and violent year ends with the assassination of a president who was becoming more popular. Well, of course, um, JFK's assassination brought into office his vice president, Lyndon Maidens Johnson. Uh, Johnson from Texas, a, of course, white Southern Democrat, it could have gone either way, whether he was going to be pro-civil rights or not, but he decided to seal John F. Kennedy's legacy by making the civil rights bill that Kennedy had been talking about his first priority. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 was the most significant civil rights law since Reconstruction. The law prohibited discrimination in public places, outlawed bias in federally assisted programs, authorized the U.S. Justice Department to initiate desegregation suits, and provided technical and financial aid to communities desegregating their schools. The most debated part of the bill, and really the most important part of the bill, I think, was Title uh, Seven. It banned employment discrimination on the basis of race, color, religion, sex, or national origin, and it created the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission to investigate and litigate cases of job discrimination. All right, so now it's going to be written into law that discrimination um, in job hiring is, uh, is illegal and somebody, the EEOC, is charged with following up on those lawsuits. <laughs> 
During the summer of 1964, the Council of Federated Organizations, which was a coalition of civil rights groups, held its Mississippi Freedom Summer Project. This project ran during the months of June, July, and August 1964, and over a thousand volunteers came to Mississippi to participate. Mississippi was a state where very few people registered to vote. Um, they had been kind of chased away from the polls by a combination of literacy tests and poll taxes and um, other kinds of, you know, outright violence, other kinds of ways in which um, people were discouraged from voting. So the notion of Freedom Summer was that young people would go down to Mississippi conduct voter registration drives, um, promote adult literacy, talk about voter literacy so that people understood what the issues were, and political organization skills. They also had what were called freedom schools where they taught African American history. African Americans made up 45 percent of the state population of Mississippi, but only five percent of voting age African Americans voted. So that gives you some sense of how important this work was. It was easy to convince black Mississippians, 86% of whom live below the poverty line, that voting could improve their life chances. Um, but it was dangerous to participate in Freedom Summer. During Freedom Summer, not only did people have regular run-ins with angry white supremacists and the KKK, but also in early June, three civil rights workers disappeared. A force of 150 FBI agents and over 200 members of the U.S. Navy led the hunt to find them. Their bodies were found in shallow graves in Philadelphia, Mississippi in early August. Um, here is a picture of them. Andrew Goodman, James Earl Cheney, and Michael Schwarmer. Um, some people were annoyed that in the North, white people were much more concerned about the deaths of Goodman, Goodman and Schwarmer than the death of Cheney. Um, it was really an eye-opening experience, I think, for many white people to discover that, yes, it was dangerous for them to go to the South and care about civil rights as well. Despite the dangers of participating in Freedom Summer, um, they had a kind of a straw poll ballot called the Freedom Ballot, and 100,000 African Americans came out and voted for this ballot that demonstrated that they were interested in voting. In August 1964, Mississippi African Americans wanted to take a separate delegation um, to the Democratic National Convention in Atlantic City to challenge the Democrats' all-white segregationist slate. So they established the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. The vice chair of the party, 68 member delegation was an extremely charismatic woman whose name you should know, Fannie Lou Hamer. Hamer was a sharecropper. She was um, extremely helpful as an organizer. And Hamer knew the dangers involved in civil rights activism. She had lost sight in one eye during a near fatal beating because of her fight for black voting rights. So, you know, Fannie Lou Hamer and her uh, group of 68 Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party um, delegates went to Atlantic City only to find that the, um, the white people refused to seat those delegates and people to whom the um, freedom strugglers appealed backed the all-white party. So President Johnson didn't help them. Hubert Humphrey didn't help them. A bunch of all, you know, liberal white congressmen didn't help them. The Miss Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party was told, you can have two seats on the floor of the convention, but you're not allowed to vote. You're not allowed to officially participate. The Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party was like, we're not going to take this back of the bus offer. And they decided to... Um, go back and work on issues that were relevant to black people in Mississippi. John Lewis considered the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party's defeat to be a turning point in the civil rights movement. Lewis said, we had played by the rules. 
done everything we were supposed to do, had played the game exactly as required, had arrived at the doorstep, and found the door slammed in our face. The final thing I'm going to talk about in this lecture is the march uh, uh, from Selma to Montgomery, Alabama, or attempted march. In March of 1965, SNCC organizer Jimmy Lee Jackson was shot and killed in Selma while protecting his mother from a police attack. Martin Luther King Jr. called for a protest march from Selma to Montgomery, Alabama to commemorate Jimmy Lee Jackson's life and to support voting rights. Lyndon Johnson urged King to call off the march, telling King that the march would negatively affect the progress of a voting rights bill through Congress. And King gave in to Johnson's request and didn't show up at the march. On March 7th, known as Bloody Sunday, marchers Sands King arrived at Edmund Pettus Bridge in Alabama, just like six blocks away from where they had started, and they were met by state troopers armed with billy clubs and tear gas. Even as the marchers stopped to kneel in prayer, the police beat them. The marchers were now forced to retreat, but they returned to the bridge three days later at King's urging. King led the march this time, but he stopped at the bridge and knelt in prayer, and they didn't go any further than the Edmund Pettus Bridge. A lot of people who participated in the march were angry at King for what they saw as his capitulation to Johnson's requests, but Johnson was able to push the 1965 Voting Rights Act through Congress, and that was very important for a very long time. The act prohibited states from imposing poll taxes and literacy requirements, and sent federal election examiners south to protect African Americans' right to register and vote. It had a significant effect on voting trends in the South. Between 1964 and 1969, for example, the percentage of black people registered to vote in Alabama increased from 19.3% to 61.3%. In Georgia, the percentage of registered black voters increased by 33%, in Mississippi, voter registration increased by, by 60%. So it was very helpful to pass the Voting Rights Act to have federal government scrutiny of these states that had a history of um, trying to keep African Americans away from the polls. The Voting Rights Act was reauthorized and reauthorized until uh, recently when Congress failed to reauthorize it saying, oh, well, the issues that are, um, were covered by the Voting Rights Act have all been resolved. Uh, they surely haven't, as partisan gerrymandering shows, but, you know, that is uh, pretty much what the lifespan of the Voter Rights Act was. At the same time the, Voter Rights, the Voting Rights Act passed, the brutal beatings that took place during the march uh, from Selma uh, including the death of one person, hurt King's reputation, undermined the effectiveness of nonviolent protests, and as we're going to see, um, begins to give rise to another movement, a movement for black separatism and black nationalism, the black power movement, which I will talk about in another lecture. Okay, I'm interested to hear what you have to say, so see you in the comments.